Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of Prime Talk. My name is Lisa Kinski. I'm here with my co-host, Yoni Mazur, and today's guest we have with us, Nathan Evans. Nathan, how are you? Hi there. I'm, I'm great. It's um, eight, just gone 8 p.m. On, on our time as well, so coming into the end of my day. But, um, <laughs> I always have energy for interesting podcasts and discussions. Wonderful, wonderful. We're so excited to have you here with us today. So everyone, Nathan is the co-founder of Fulfin, and Fulfin is a company that is providing working capital for the digital economy. So we're going to talk about Fulfin at the end of the episode, but Nathan, this is really going to be your hour. So we want to talk about where you were born, your experiences growing up, any other entrepreneurial ventures you may have had, and really walk through your life to where you are today in e-com, because I know you have some involvement in the community as well. So um, let's go on ahead and jump straight to it. Where are you from? Right. So um, I was born in small town England. Um, this place is called Burton on Trent. It's on a on a line between Birmingham and Manchester, probably geographically um, a third away from Birmingham and two thirds from Manchester and culturally the other way around. So we're kind of very northern, I think, from that part of the world, kind of kind of di direct, but have, a, have warm hearts. Um, yeah, and I now I now live in Munich. Germany quite a few years later. I've been in the German speaking part of the world since 2001. Okay, awesome. And we'll get to that. But around the Burton on Trent area, what was the main industry? What did your parents do when you were growing up? Mm, okay. And um, I always think it's like the smelliest town in the in the UK because it's a brewery, it's a brewing town. One of the traditional things that's the main the main industry is is beer, but it had a couple of niche products as well. It had like a big a big tire factory for Pirelli as well. So so if it's, it's either smelling of beer or rubber or a a product that's like Vegemite as well, Marmite that it was called as well, which is a very very very. Uh, I know. Yeah. I heard about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, it's the, cool. The, like uh, yeah, uh, British. The I don't know. I don't know if it's a dessert or a spread for bread or something. I don't know what it was. It, it looks like Nutella and it tastes like crude oil. I think that's the, yeah, yeah. That's, the that's the thing. So yeah, not not really particularly an a, attractive town, but um, very interesting, close to some of the most beautiful countryside in Tolkien-esque type of little shires um, out there. The Derbyshire Peak Districts are a wonderful part of the part of the world. Yeah, my fam my family, my my father was um, a carpet fitter, sometimes had his, his own small business, no academic background at all. My, my mother was a housewife looking, looking after us. I was the first guy in the family to go to, to, go to university. Gotcha. Got and mom was a housewife looking after how many kids? Just yourself or was uh, your whole no, gaggle? No, no, myself and my little sister at the time, which was, I think, kept her busy. And how did you largely spend your time when you were growing up? Were you really into your studies, playing a lot of sports or trying to find ways to make money? What was your focus? Yeah, I, th I think I had some kind of transformational moments even when I was, I was growing up. So I think at the start, I was, I was a quite nerdy and quite introspective kid as, as well. You know, I was, I was a kid that in, as well as having bedtime stories, I'd have, I'd have my parents write down maths problems. I, I definitely had some ability, not through asking it and, and some, I know now there's people with a lot more ability than me and a natural, a natural inclination to, towards. Um, that wasn't very sporty, I think, to start with. It was a little bit of a, like the, 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 fat, the fat nerdy kid for my, my years up until 10, 12. And then suddenly the puppy fat dropped off me. Um, I got more sporty. I, I joined something called Air Cadets in the UK as well, which is like when you're interested in the um, the Royal Air, Air Force and potentially going into that career. And then did a lot of outdoor activ activities, be that rifle shooting, be that adventure camps, be, be, that, be that flying, um, yeah. and just kind of a bit of, yeah, different experience for me then. Nice. Gotcha. So having joined the Air Cadets, did you have plans to enlist after graduation or what was kind of your goal around mm -hmm. 16, 17 years old? Mm, yeah, I, I went as as far as um, pilot selection, so may, made it through, um, didn't get through that based on my eyes and didn't continue. Then you could go on different paths as air traffic controller or navigator. Nothing, nothing I think particularly appealed to me. Maybe we, we all watched too much Top Gun when we were young and just wanted to sit <laughs> in, the front, in, in the front seat. Um, and I had, I had a great time and there was that point that I decided, okay, I'm going to university rather than go into the Royal Air Force for what would have been a second choice job but I, I i still you know loved the experience and the and the, the discipline that it that it brought into me there's, cer there's certain things i think about having something 
even at a even at a cadet level where the military touches your life that can do a lot for a young man that's great interesting yeah so then you decided to enroll in university what what was the track that you chose i guess what field of study and where did you first enroll so i think i was fortunate enough not to to have parents that have no idea how the game works and have no idea what you're supposed to do and just simply let me do what i was passionate about and i, I was just passionate about the, the big questions and i I um, chose to study physics. It wasn't ever going to be anything else, maybe physics or mathematics, but physics kind of had that, that wonderful awe of the universe aspect uh, about it. And I think I chose a course, which was physics with a year in, in Germany. Um, and that came simply from the fact that the school that I, I went to was a, a comprehensive school in the Midlands, um, poor, poor academics, not great teaching staff at at that time, it was a it was a difficult time. I think for the UK in the eighties when I was when I was growing up, as well, a lot of the funding had been taken away, and we saw we had two teachers that really cared about their kids, and one taught mathematics and one and one taught German, and and had the French teacher been better, I might have been doing this podcast <laughs> from from Lyon or Marseille or something, and, and not from Munich, but that that set me on my way. And so this is what year that you had enrolled in in college or in university. I was a seven, I'm a 75 vintage, and that would be 93 when I started at, at Imperial in London. And that was my first time out of small town England, really, as well. And suddenly it's okay, the, the buildings are five stories tall here. And, you know, and, and not that kind of two story minor, terraced minor houses. And the first time I see London, it's, it's kind of blew my, blew my mind in many great and wonderful ways. Did exactly what university is supposed to do for you. You know, it, it allowed me to grow up as a, as a person. I think, and, and, so and be educated for life. That was 93 when you said you enrolled at Imperial, so Imperial mm -hmm. College in London. So you mm -hmm. moved moved abroad. I'm assuming you didn't live at home while you were at school. It was too far. Oh, I don't understand it, the, the uh, yeah, geography. Yeah, the scope of geography, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it abroad. When we're, 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 we're still on the island, but yeah, you go you go and live in halls. For the first, you live in halls for the first year. Um, it was you know, quite a, a non-standard accommodation uh, path after so the second year of university we, I lived on a boat um, because we couldn't afford a flat in London we found out so one of my um, but, uh, schools, on the Thames River that is on, on a little canal you can't really live on on the river and it, it sounds wonderfully glamorous you think like some people are living on houseboats in in London that probably cost more than your houses put together I mean this is there are there are great and, and, and wonderful uh, marine vehicles there. But this was like a, a little, little canal boat moored behind the back of King's Cross. Uh, yeah. So I was, I was walking home past the prostitutes and the drug addicts um, after um, coming back home from study, going into our little place, um, sleeping in a place that was close to the water. So pretty much a lot of my clothes were getting damp and going going into university and going to the gym so I could shower in the morning and not smell. Um, oh, wow. On the up yeah, on the upside, I was paying like twenty dollars a week rent as opposed to a hundred and hundred and something, which it, it would have been. And you know, we took we took our boat shopping to Camden, to Camden That's Market cool. in London, which was yeah. That's very cool. It's a story, at least. Probably not so good for my health, but it was yeah <laughs> interesting at the time. And so you said you were studying physics while you were at Imperial College. Mm -hmm. Did you yeah. pursue all four years there? And what did that journey look like? And the third year they shipped us out to Germany. That was that was part of the deal. That's of course this year in Germany. And then it was the total opposite. So it was like it was a great juxtaposition of if I'm being in London, that you know, as a city of twenty million, I guess, with great greater London in, included, and it taking you two hours to get from one end to the other end of the of the town. And then in Germany I, I went to a very small um regional Provincial, provincial town called Freiburg. It's in the southwesterly corner of Germany, and it is just beautiful. It's the sunniest town in Germany. It's the most eco-friendly hippie town in in Germany, and that's where I probably learnt German properly as well. You don't learn a language in the classroom; you learn a language in in the bars, effectively. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Full immersion, amazing. Um, so, what what was your kind of goal after graduation? What type? You said that you were going to school for physics, but what was the career path? 
Yeah, good question again. I mean, I didn't have parents who under, understood how the game worked, and I myself did not understand how the game worked, and I studied for the love of studying. And that was it. And what was going to come after that, I don't think I had a great and wonderful concept. And it's probably fortunate because I think people who have a master plan, most people's master plan goes wrong in life because it, it's too exact. So I, th I think I figured out one thing and I stayed true to that. I, I wanted to go where the smart kids were. Being a kid myself, I wanted, I wanted to work with the smart people. I wanted to work where it was exciting. And so in Imperial being in London and physicists being quantitative and us being quite and next to the financial district effectively across the town. Um, pretty much half of the guys from Imperial and physics, my feeling is we went into the city, the city being the, the London equivalent. City of London Austria, finance, yeah. Austria. Now, what year did you graduate? 97. 1997, so what are you, what's your first station after college? Where do you go? Um, I went to a boutique investment bank that belong to one of the UK's biggest um, universal banks, NatWest, called Greenwich NatWest. It was a, um, they bought it, I think, as an American house that, that they bought. And I was in the department that was involved with exotic derivatives, which is effectively the most complicated mathematical products that, that you can touch. And you had a lot of people in the bank. There were some guys who were trading them. I wasn't trading them at the I wasn't in trading at that, at that time. And then you had a lot of people who were making sure that those guys were playing the game fairly as well. And so this is what the they risk. call the quants these days or no? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I right. was in a quantitative role. We we were pricing the books up independently from the traders to make sure we were coming to the, the same conclusions because you, you can have products that have like 50 years maturity and the trader's life is maybe like five years and he's he's gone and he's had his bonus for five years and the thing goes wrong 15 years later. Um, not a great situation for the, for the bank. So they had a lot of smart maths guys trading them and also a lot of smart maths guys making sure that everything was being done above board. Almost sounds like a function of auditing to make sure everything's really uh, reconciled properly uh, and, and fair and square. Yeah. Well, these, these, yeah, these products just weren't liquid. So you, you couldn't look for a price. That was, it was a lot of modeling that was, mm. that was going on. But it, yeah, it was kind of fun and it was, it was a bit nerdy, um, but it's all very abstract when you're in, when you're in a role. Like like that. Got it. And now how many years did you stay there? Mm, it must have been two or three. And then I had as almost an about face as you can possibly do due to the fact that I could supposedly speak German. I fell into a role in interbank broking which is effectively on being in front office, which I hadn't been before. Before I'd been in what you would term middle office in a risk role. That's a little bit like always the bridesmaid, never the bride. And yeah, I always want to be where the German, the German have an expression like where the music plays. I'm not sure if we say it so much in English anymore, but I want to be where the action was. And inter, interbank broking, you, you are closing deals. So you're not trading, but you are the guy who is arranging the trades between the traders. What's it called? Um, interbank what? What is it again? Uh, broking. So it's it's brokering. You, uh, bro broking. So it's brokerage. So it is as close as you can imagine. It's a the Wolf of Wall Street environment. Mm -hmm. I was I was there with a phone in each hand, a phone on a phone on the desk. Um, Twenty guys shouting all, all around me. Guys two and a half times the size of me <laughs> coming nose nose to nose to me at some point, telling me to do my expletive job and call my expletive clients. I I grew up quite a lot in that year. <laughs> I was hold on, hold on. So, how does this connect to Germany again? You had to move to Germany for this role, or this was mm, uh, you I, had to speak in German to trade okay, with Germany so or something? Yeah, so I was still in the UK. I got bought in by a guy who wanted to set up a German business on the desk. He thought he'll get a kid who's supposedly smart, um, wet behind the ears to a great extent, who can speak some German, and we're going to stick what's called the ISMA book, a big book listing all the banks in Germany and all the contacts for the products that I traded in my hand and say, okay, go build yourself a business. So even though you, you are working for a house, you're working for a brokerage company, um, it's very entrepreneurial. You you eat what you kill. That's wow. it. And, you, and, yeah, and you're wow. and with 20 guys on the desk who do exactly the same. Um, it's, it's, it's Was tough. it successful? I mean, where did you, I mean, how long did you survive this kind of role? Sounds very good. Um, yeah, I, well, how long ago? So I left after a year, but I that's where the link to Germany comes in. I was very successful in it. I built I built the business. I built a German franchise, basically retraining. And 
my biggest client of that business that, that I built um, when I went out to visit them to buy them dinner in Munich, as one as one does to thank to thank them for the business that they were putting my way. Um, they poached me. Mm. Okay, where well, was that? They were poaching you or transition to I guess to live in Germany as well. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a very easy one to remember. I moved to Germany on the 11th of September 2001. Oh man, what a date! Yeah, <laughs> well, remember, take us take us that moment, September 11, 2001. Yeah, you, something you, happened you, if you, I remember. You yeah. landed there with, with the airport, or what was the tra transition? Mm -hmm. the yeah, I, I I took off and landed on that day. It was a, like a European flight. That was the day I was going to move. That was the day I was going to move out on. And you know, I can remember that thing quite maybe more specifically than. Mm, many people in Europe would because I went through the airports and I remember there wasn't any of the security that followed afterwards it just seemed that the whole world was in a daze about what was happening and so trying to figure out what had really happened mm, yeah very very very, very so, so this times. happened before you took, uh, went on the flight or uh, when you landed uh, took, uh, it took I mean happened no, after or during or I distinctly remember being in London walking walking on Tottenham Court Road and seeing the um the headlines uh, and you still were able to go on the, on the airplane and fly to Germany? Yep. Yep. Okay, good. Okay, at least you didn't get shut down and were able to settle. Interesting. Okay, so you oh. settled into Germany, into this position, and how long were you there for? Uh, there, I was then in Germany initial, initially from 2001 to 2008. And went through, a variety, yeah, went through a variety of um, traded different products. So I started what's called that short-end products. Um, not very liquid, a little bit boys, boys playing, I think at the time, uh, again, lots of kind of artificial prices and you needed to have a lot of information. You needed to talk to the broker as well to understand what was going on. It was a very, very totally different from where I started with but highly mathematical products to these being these kind of flow, um, products built a business for that bank as well. What was called corporate re repo. So bond, a bond lending business from all the bonds that are issued by corporations. Um, enjoyed it greatly, transitioned later to the credit derivatives department of that bank as well, and was trading subordinated debt, credit default swaps, market making, emerging market bonds. It was, it was a regional bank, so you, you wore a lot of hats. Um, and um, then the financial crisis came and- uh, Doesn't whole, it, yeah. Global financial crisis world got turned on its head head that, again that that affected you because you mentioned you were there until 2008 so was that a region where you i guess shifted to the next station yeah absolutely like every everything that you knew and believed and everything that you had that it was a very very peculiar time and i've always tried to think of like the metaphors for it when i've explained it to people i have an email to my my wife and girlfriend at the time i think i'd said it's the way to imagine it, it's like you're walking around Munich and everybody's stand on the corner. There's a man standing there on every corner selling a brand new Porsche 911 with complete papers, fully genuine. You know it's a great car and they're trying to sell it for a thousand euros and nobody's buying. And that's really what it felt, felt like. You know, we had all of these books and all of these high quality assets that people knew were good and everybody had to sell because the banks needed to, needed to be liquid. And it was it, it was such a crazy time that relationships were, were basically being destroyed. People's personal relationships were being destroyed because of the stress. One of my colleagues got taken into a mental, effectively a mental sanatorium because they'd marked, they were marking down their books so, so much they, they, couldn't, they couldn't really cope. And yeah, it was, became a very, very good time to exit stage left because banking changed as well after that all of the innovation went out of it all of the excitement went out of it all of the freedom went out of it it became as it probably needed to be a lot more highly regulated at, at the at the time um, a lot more slow moving and i had an opportunity that had come up a little bit earlier to move to switzerland and go and work effectively for big tech so the largest provider of financial services software globally so fintech before it was called fintech really a company at that time called Sun sunguard um that wanted to pay me a lot of money to live in a beautiful place and have an interesting life that was not directly involved with um let's say business risk on the on from being on the trading floor 
which at some point you can only lose if, if you're in that environment. And yeah, I took the, I, I took the offer gratefully at the time. Where did you go? So you moved to Switzerland? So then I lived in Switzerland. I moved it to Switzerland and that was oh, to Zurich. I, I lived, I worked in Zurich and I ended up living in a village called Fetikonschwitz, which is down the side of Lake Zurich. And the reason that that happens is that tax in Switzerland is competitive. So you're taxed on a, a federal level, a country level, a canton, so a state level, and a Gemeinde, which is a community level. And you could you could figure out by moving by moving 25 minutes down the side of the lake, living then right by the lake. So I, every morning, my morning would start with a jump into Lake Zurich, the biggest private swimming pool ever, was how I, I heard it was, being 15 mm. minutes from my closest ski resort, being then only an hour and 15 away from Davos, and pick, picking up a good five-figure amount in salary net, because my tax liability had, had changed, seemed like a pretty good a pretty good deal. Nice. Okay, so how long were you there for? Mm, I moved back with heavy heart, I have to say, to, to Munich in 2015, having worked for big tech for, for five, maybe five of those years, having worked as being man number four through the door for a startup that has gone um, international and become very huge in Switzerland, a startup called B. Beekeeper that then I didn't I didn't stay with maybe that goes down as a bad decision or, or a bad course of uh, events, um, and working for the Swiss Stock Exchange for a couple of years I even had time out um, in that time in Switzerland to do a more a social business engagement project of building a a school and learning centre so a social business in Cambodia, um, wow. yeah so it's a lot of yeah, so, honestly, you were in Switzerland for about uh, seven years, from like 2008 until 2015? Yeah. And you did uh, basically, uh, I guess, tech, right? Startup, tech and startup, and then some uh, educational social. Mm, a, little, a little bit of education uh, and, and social when I, I had time to do it. And then I, at the Swiss Stock Exchange, that was really infrastructure. You know, that, that was effectively what makes money move between these banks and and. It's kind of exciting because it's it's the amount of money. It's, it's about money coming out of the machines at the end of the day, and the banks being able to provide liquidity. So sitting in there with the Swiss National Bank, the heads of the Swiss Nas National Bank, um, figuring out how how we're going to replace and renew the twenty five year old infrastructure that was that was stable, but was just making that had a lot of friction. Um, Guys, so I do want to take a pause in two thousand fifteen for a moment. We're going to continue from that point on, but because your uh, experience is very uh, extensive. But it's unique in the fact that it's less front end; it's more back end uh, plumbing for the financial world. You know, you also mentioned repo. I know repo yeah. with with numbers; it's actually gigantic. It's it's even hard to understand how big it is in terms of scale of money. But most average people are not even aware or have no clue. So, if we could take this a bit with the combination of what you did in, in Germany and also Switzerland with the banks, talk to us a little bit about that world, which is less known uh, uh, to to people. But yeah, it's, it's, I guess it comes from Treasury, which is about funding, which again links back, I guess, to what I'm doing today as as well. So it's so Treasury, if you're living in the United States, that's the Federal Reserve, right? So these are the, the those organizations, the bodies of a country that are able to make money, print money, correct? So it's, it's basically the Treasury function of, of the bank. The bank needs to fund itself. They fund themselves mainly via the central banks. They take part in, in tenders. And then they scramble around the market to make sure that all of those assets that they have on the bank, because a bank doesn't have money, it's it's leveraged to an extent. So it ha it buy it buys assets and it it refinances them. And that at the end of the day, you know, you you have to have that balance on your on your books to make sure that everything you you own is is refinanced. And a lot of products and a lot of trading actually spring sprung up around these back office what were previously back office functions. So I spent like the first half of my financial services career effectively in the front office trading these roles and and then sometime in, in switzerland in the whole infrastructure i would have been figuring out okay when i did a trade this is actually what happened this is this is how the bonds moved this is how the money moved so that everything was as secure as people believe um believe it was but yeah the numbers the numbers couldn't be couldn't be bigger 
Yeah, yeah. In the trillions, uh, right? The trillions of dollars yeah. or euros or, or Swiss uh, uh, francs and, and, and the sorts. Yeah. I mean, I'm and not, I'm also, I, I want to yeah. touch in, in the in the nutshell because you mentioned the global financial price, uh, crisis affected you. Were your organization uh, directly involved with with um, with the subprime mortgages, or were indirectly got affected because of it? Uh, every um, everybody had big investment books that were full of AAA assets, which were effectively MBS and ABS that that hadn't moved in price for five years plus or however long it had been, and then within a few months of the financial crisis, were being marked down. 10 20 big figures plus you know so the organization like, you're working you know, with on its balance sheet had those toxic assets so to speak everybody had those toxic everybody, assets yes. in any sort of but but i think the german regional banks um probably in some ways to a greater extent because they the greatest competitive advantage that they had was they had a lot of historic cheap money because they'd had a state guarantee before effectively mm -hmm. i worked for a state a state bank and they'd loaded up on they loaded up on these assets and then you know, it came home to roost, basically. So you're saying because uh, historically it was backed by the government, uh, there was more faith in this toxic, high yielding, uh, 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 safe appearing uh, um, um, asset, which is actually very toxic and bad. So they loaded mm. up even, uh, you know, even more than others. They, they, they loaded up because they had cash. Because when, if you have a if you have a state guarantee, what that lets you do is borrow money cheaply. So what mm. you do. Is you go and borrow money cheaply okay fine now you've got money and you have to do something with it you have you have money to has to make money yeah yeah so it has to be invested in something and when the amounts are, are that large it's not going to go into equities it's going to go into what's termed like fixed income products and then it's going to go mostly into highly rated but we all know that the rating system um That's didn't rough. reflect yeah. the, the true risk of the true economic risk of those of those products at the time Got it. Yeah, I did not realize the German uh, banking industry was so heavily uh, invested in that. I, I, uh, I'm more familiar with the American side of the story, which was very devastating financially to many others. Okay, let's jump back into 2015. Uh, what's your next station? You move back to Germany? Mm, yep. Yeah. Um, I left Switzerland. I, I, leaving it was was the was the the venture. I, I think of it as God's own country, still. Still the Marble expression. Munich is a beautiful place to be. Bavaria is a wonderful part of the world. But in Switzerland, the mountains are higher and, and steeper. The lakes, the lakes are deeper and bluer. And and the people are, for my taste, more 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 charming. Like they they speak different languages depending on where you were in Switzerland. Around Zurich, they speak Swiss German, which is a dialect of German. So it's a type of German, and they think a type of Anglo-Saxon. So their sense of humour is quite aligned and, and their niceties, their polite their politeness is, is very much more Anglo Saxon and in Bavaria there's a lot it's a lot more direct. I think right. where I am. So I would have been very happy to stay there for a much longer time and and then um, apply for a Swiss passport, but you need 13 years for that. And I managed to stay in Switzerland so long. I managed to stay there when I had a girlfriend in Germany and when my girlfriend became my fiance. I still managed to stay in Switzerland and we had a distance relationship. It was about three, four hours between Zurich. But your partner, and she was German uh, national or Swiss? She was and is still German. Um, mm -hmm. So she grad she graduated from being my girlfriend to uh, my fiance. I didn't move back. Then my wife. And I still didn't move. I still didn't move back. We still had a life. And then something happened. She became the expectant mother of my future children. Mm hmm. And that's the game changer. So I don't, you know, so I didn't have a master plan, particularly in life. I had more of, I think, values and beliefs, always, even before I knew to recognize them as values and, and beliefs and had a, a kind of a framework. And one thing is I wouldn't know if I was going to be a dad or not a dad. But if I'm going to be a dad, I'm going to be a bloody good dad. Nice. I'm not going to be a dad who's away four days a week, whatever, whatever the cost may, the cost may be. So the choice was my wife was going to come to Switzerland or I was going to go to Munich and her coming to Switzerland for several reasons just wasn't really feasible at the, at the time. So that was a junction and trigger the you know, expecting a baby mm -hmm. so that pulled yep. you back into Munich. Okay. So you settle back in Munich. Thank God you have a, you know, you start a family and well, what do you do for a living? What's your professional trans mm -hmm. transition? I go and work for, I get into e-commerce. 
effectively at, at, at that point. I go to work for one of the largest B2B e-commerce platforms in Germany, a company at the time called Mercatio, now called Unite, um, with amazing and inspirational leadership. Some of the really the academically most highly qualified, most intelligent people within within that small group of leadership in Munich, where we had the fledgling data science team, product management, where I I was working then at the time and the leadership of the company. And this is this is a company that Amazon tried, well, Google tried to kill it and they couldn't kill it. And Amazon tried to kill it and they couldn't kill it because this, this company just understood that I think one thing very specifically that procurement and purchasing are two different things, especially in, in Germany. And they understood procurement in Germany. They understood the process. So hold on, let me understand this company a little bit more and then what you did, did for the, or inside this company. So this company is a marketplace? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a, effectively a marketplace, a huge shop, depending on your definition of marketplace. At the uh, time. So, so, uh, it, yeah, it, so, so they buy and sell themselves and also you have third party sellers or, or it's more like eBay where there's only third party sellers buying and selling there. What's the... Uh, more, more like neither of those, but the other version. So they would, they would be what would be termed a single creditor. So if you bought, you would bought, you would be buying from Mercatio, but out the back, they would have 600 suppliers plugged in and it would, you would say effect, it'd be a drop shipping. Yep. Yep. And, so the, the, yeah, so a drop shipping market marketplace and uh, I guess Google and Amazon tried to tar target this model, but they stayed successful because I guess they were able to really create a selection, competitive landscape and variety uh, like no other, uh, to, you know, cater to the German Right, consumer market or yeah. a European consumer market? What's the scope of their, their exposure? I think I, you know, I, I learned something about startups from that company as well. This was a, this was a startup from 1999. Yeah, this was what we <laughs> term a, a prehistoric monster of the German taxi. And this company had been dead four or five times over, I think, but, but too stubborn to actually roll over and finally die. You know, the management there, um, Sebastian was the, the founder who was, who was still there. They just kept plugging away at it, and they they'd gone from effectively at one point being a project, an IT project type of company, to being the marketplace, to believing in their vision of of the uh, of the marketplace, and then over the years, kind of getting it right. How did Google try to kill them by simply um, prohibiting B two B ads? I think it was at the time. So when a lot of the almost all of the um volumes and business came by google ads at the time effectively overnight that was that was turned off and they they were lucky at the time that they'd um they built within their platform a little bit of procurement functionality so enabling your boss to sign off on a purchase enabling limits to be set enabling people to use what uh varen i guess we call it category groups within within a, a corporate and one big German DAX 30 company had been using this marketplace and said, you know, we like that functionality so much. We'd like to use it, not just, we'd like to use it for all of our procurement. So can you build it for us? And so that's what this company did. It basically piggybacked, it had its anchor client for a while, and then it managed to roll that out to other clients. And Enterprise level, it, yeah, yeah, uh, procuring. Yeah. Interesting. And they, and they found out that when the guys, something interesting happened, when the guys, the, the corporate clients used the procurement functionality, they bought more on the marketplace that was, mm. that, was that was native, that, that was plugged in. So it's these, this kind of intelligence that was there. And now this company's transitioned basically into a B2B, a true marketplace where people can actually have their, their shops and their presence leveraging that network that they, that they previously had. I said, what I, did you I, specialize in the organization? What did you do for them? So I was um, in product management, effectively responsible for financial and transactional products. So pay, payments, processing, and lending to that extent. And who are you lending to? The, uh, the merchants selling to the platform or, or the consumer mm, buying, the, shopping, financing? The, the, it wasn't consumers, but businesses. It was a B2B platform. And we were lending to the businesses buying on the platform by extending their payment terms. Got it, very nice. Yeah, like we have here in the States, uh, Affirm, that's more on the consumer side. I don't know if they have it on the business side, but Affirm, uh, when you have a, maybe a big purchase, be able to kind of uh, uh, you know get payments on it. Uh, I think most uh, respectable platforms that have this kind of functions. All right, so 2015, uh, you stay there until uh, when? 
That's a good question. I think it was 2017. I right, so what do you got next? Mm -hmm. um, I got lifted into, I got an offer um, by recruiters working for some well-known venture capitalists to go into a Munich um, fintech lender, SME lender company. As it would be. What's SME? As it would, um, small and medium enterprise. Mm -hmm. Basically, okay. so business business lending. Yep. Um, and I, and they wanted to me with basically the, the product management and the and the e commerce shops. And I'd seen this, I'd seen what we had done with with lending. You know, it was very very interesting what we what we managed to do in Mercatio. I'd seen that without using traditional data, using transactional data, we were be we are able to lend uh, money at the time. Above twenty percent, which seemed like the 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 world, um, with zero defaults, because we knew that these guys were. What kind of uh, businesses you're lending to? Um, broad SMEs across at that point in Mexico. in Germany or globally. Uh, in 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 Germany, mm -hmm. but we could choose we could choose who we lent to. So simply by being able to say, okay, we have we know this guy. He's traded on the platform. He's never had a late. He's never paid an invoice. Um, late, he has this size of, size of transactions and one or two other data points. Okay, let's let's see what happens if we extend credit to him. Uh, so, okay, this is this and, is and which good. platform was that? You mentioned a platform. Which platform was that? Where you, I guess, you were able to see the transactional data. Um, that was that was when I was at Mercatio before uh -huh. up to 2018. We had our own transactional data. That that was that was the edge that that we basically had. These guys were buying on the platform all the time. Um, we. You've had a lot of fraud potential built into it as well as every as every, every platform needs to have. But with regards to this little, it was a niche product. It wasn't it wasn't strategic for the company, but it showed how interesting it could be that you could really lend to businesses, and it showed like the constraint that businesses have, like how serious the liquidity problem is. That the guys were prepared to pay the equivalent of twenty plus percent per year, to rather than pay after seven days, to pay to pay after thirty days. Uh, the whole SME landscape is, and within e-commerce even even more so totally constrained by the requirement for liquidity yeah so but what's the typical uh lend, lend an amount uh for those smes small or medium uh, enterprises mm, i think it depends on your your platform and the business you're you're doing so that answer today with open which we'll get to is is, is totally different to that answer back then, back then it was several hundreds so it was high three high three figure low four figure baskets that yeah. we were extend, extending payment terms on yeah. so it was simply buy now pay later is what you would term it today you go into you go into the basket and you click a button that says you pay this if you pay after seven days you pay this if you pay after 14 days you pay this if you pay after 30 days and that's you know pretty much that's it so hovering around the thousand euro i guess uh mark area and there was enough scale for that to be lucrative uh, for, for 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 the organization to make it, uh, it, enough money it, i think it's a hobby but you know, it was it, it, it was nice, and we were we were very very interested, even in that early stage of 2015, like how how we were utilizing data science within our pricing and and our margin and our markup um, compared to how other less advanced companies were using it. We were we were bleeding edge then, and so looking at this. this Simply, I think the, the the company, the leadership felt, and probably still do feel that you know, they want to conquer the world. It's okay, yeah, we want to. Then let's lend to our, let's be a bank as well. Nice. Yeah, so yeah. do that, and, and then uh, what's your next station? Uh, yeah. So then I went into a um, a little lender in uh, based in Munich that was doing horizontal SME lending. Is what I would I would call it. So or what it, it is called. So that means lending to again to broadly across all types of SMEs and um, needing to come, being brought in effectively with one or two other senior hires to help we were told professionalize and digitalize the company. And um, I probably not at liberty to say too much about that company and mm -hmm. what happened. It's okay. um, yeah, apart from the fact that it, you know, it, it's no longer with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it became Clear. And that's, I still colloquially I, I refer to that that company as it's where I met my co-founder Freddie for full thing, and I, I say often you know that that was our Vietnam, and you send boys and girls to Vietnam and men and women 
come back. So all I say is that sometimes the best preparation you can have to do something is to know exactly what you shouldn't do. Mm. And so to so almost rather than to say a good preparation is to kind of have a rough idea, somebody train you kind of what you should do. If somebody kind of tells you this is exactly what will get you into trouble, this is exactly wrong. It's not bad to if you, if you can get smart on somebody else's dollar, I think is the expression. Then you're, how, long you're did, how long did how long did you uh, did you survive there? How long was that uh, engagement? Matter of months. Got it. And then that what gave birth into fulfill, or there was something else in between? Um, after that, I checked out, took the opportunity to fly out to the U.S. West Coast. I'd done my, I'd done an MBA a few years earlier when I'd been in Switzerland with um, the U.S. School Kellogg. Keller School of Management and the German startup school, VHU. And I had a good network across the, the US and I, I wanted to breathe the air, basically. I, I'd had guys who'd been in my cohort when, when I'd done the program, who'd moved to California, sold their business to Facebook for, for 90 million in 2011. And I, I, you know, and I, remember, I remember specifically them showing, showing me the, their product at the time on a, on a smartphone and getting the message like two weeks later, hey, great news, Nathan, we've sold it to Facebook and we're moving to the Valley. So I went in and they, they, you know, they, they took me into Facebook, showed me Zuckerberg's desk, uh, Cheryl's room. Um, I visited Cheryl Sandberg, people, right? yeah, the CEO of yeah. uh, Meta back in there on Facebook. Yeah, and I went, um, and then I went basically down, did the 101. That down Highway 101 or down the West Coast from, um, with, the, with the family, the, our daughter at the time, my, my wife and a, and a bright colored camper van starting up in San Francisco, ending down in San Diego um, and dropping into tech meetups, catching up with all of the Kellogg guys, looking at the, looking at the fintechs, trying to get some inspiration, see what had worked, what, what hadn't worked. Um, so that was a, that was a couple of months um, in 2000, end of 2017, and then came back and founded Fulfin with these learnings and with this this inspiration, and then with my co-founder at the start of 2018. Yeah, so from Vietnam, quote unquote, to uh, the West Coast, Silicon Valley, taking it in, seeing what's going on, you know, catching base with, with your cohorts and uh, buddies from from uh, you know uh, the university for a master's degree, and then uh, go back, settle into uh, Munich, but you know, found fulfill, uh, fulfill, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so take yep. us there to those moments, the mission, the objective, and, and where you guys are today. You know, I, th I think there's a tendency to revise history, you know, years later to make it all sound sexier than it did and to make it look like you knew exactly what you were doing right at the start, but <laughs> we, we, we clearly did it. There had been, I think, the recognition in the previous company that, there's something interesting here, like digital lending. It when it works, it's wonderful because you can charge a lot of money for a short-term product. It's it's very attractive unit economics, but when you get it wrong, it hurts because lending is a is a game where your downside is always par, is always the whole amount that you lend. So if you have any fraud cases, it kills the business. If you if you have um, serious defaults, it, it kills the business. So the the trick is to find okay. What are the good types of clients? What are the bad types of clients? And, and the bad types of clients are those that don't get money from, from the, the traditional financial, financial services industry for all of the right reasons, because they're understood. They're just bad credit. Like they can't afford to pay it back. They're poorly run shops. They're in, they're in highly cyclical industries. You don't want those guys. But then you have a whole other section of the economy, which is underserved because the financial service industry isn't doing its job properly. It's not up to speed. It doesn't understand them. So that is going to be young, high growth, digital, asset light companies, everything that financial services really doesn't like. Mm. And, and basically, you can say that sounds a lot like e-commerce. Uh, sounds like a typical Amazon seller, lean, digital, not physical, no real assets on the balance sheet, yeah. except by, you know, the understanding of the market and then being able to generate revenue and making profit on it. Uh, which is for the lenders typically is not they want something to hold on to if the inventory physically in some warehouse which they don't because it's sent to fba or uh, an office or a building or, or equipment or something but that's typically not the case so they're being underserved even though they can definitely uh pay uh 20 percent on money short term for a few weeks a few months uh and, and that can just you know continue to fuel uh, the growth so it sounded like it was kind of a turbulence for you to understand you know the gaps and um 
you know, the opportunities. And they, when it all came together, it talked to us about that moment where, you know, things came together for Fulfin and really, really uh, able to, you know, establish yourself uh, with the mission and purpose and then, you know, uh, achieve success and scale and growth. Because, you know, this uh, you started this journey about six years ago. So I'm sure there was a mm -hmm. significant milestones here. Yeah, um, I think it's been about the improvement in the quality of the team that we had. Being in Munich, we we sit very close to a very well respected university, or well, two of them, um, the Ludwig Maximilians University of Munich and the Technical University of Munich. And so, you know, we had no we had no money, we had no venture capital backing as well. We weren't a typical start like the typical uh, uh, investor friendly type of founders. We were older post financial services, so we bootstrapped it for. A year and a half with our own money we made the first loans out of our own pocket using legal loopholes i will call i will call them or exceptions to the financial regulation within within germany to make the first the first few loans um partly that up to an extent where we could go and pitch a vc um that had the connection via the Vehau network who became our first investor who gave us our first equity financing and, so, and some debt financing and not a not a slug, but it was definitely kind of step for step for step for step for step. Layer um, after layer, yeah. Yeah, getting the, getting the team, getting the really smart kids from these from these universities. One gent, I call him a gentleman. I can't refer to him as a as a kid anymore. Doing his PhD in Stanford now in AI, founding as well. Who who built our first treasury backend? Like we were too, we were too stupid to know that you could actually buy these things off the shelf. So we just built everything. Um, mm. And that's probably become one of our our USP is the fact that we we have that knowledge internalized in in the house. We we, we recently received a seven figure subsidy from the German state um, to further our work in um, AI powered um, credit limits for SMEs, um, because we haven't bought in models. We have built our own models with our with our own with our own guys. We've done the thousands of trades that you need to understand um, this this market in in Germany, but it's. It's tough. It's tough business. Uh, it's and as we've noticed with our competitors as as well, some who have recently, um, it's been declared that they're closing down their businesses as well. You're always only a few defaults away from basically having to close a shop. So you have to be very, 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 very rigorous around the processes, um, very, very innovative around your risk models, and very, very strategic around your your targeting as well. Got it. I do want to kind of clear out a few things. So you're based in Germany and you cater to the German-based SME, small and medium enterprises. So if I'm an Amazon seller based in Germany, how can you help me? How does Fulfilled, you know, what kind of uh, uh, products does Fulfilled uh, have to, to help me? We try we try to keep it simple. So we have the, the, the one simple product that then you configure to your needs, but it's a, it's a short-term working capital loan. Um, we don't, replace banks per se that's not what we're there for we're not there particularly under many circumstances to find com to finance companies that, that cannot get financed by banks that might be true of the very young guys because then banks won't look at companies that are they say under one two years tip typically normally two years we will look at a company after three months mm. so we think we, we we have enough data um market data effectively and model uh, data and then the data from that company to be able to make a good call on the credit to be able to give them their first loan so then then what we're doing is replacing venture capital or we're, we're replacing equity so we're, we're enabling those guys to use leverage and debt financing as early as possible and to keep ownership of their company and that's cool because you're building something you want to keep as much of it as you can and then later on as these companies mature and they have you know good six figure, seven figure, even eight, eight figure revenue. What we found out is that the thesis that these, these companies would outgrow us and simply they'll be financed by banks is, is incorrect. They then they do work with the banks and they have some banking products and with the banks, you have that very, very stable base of your financing that you always kind of need. So you always have that leverage, but guess what? It's, it's, it's e-commerce and everybody in e-commerce has seasonality, there's volatility, there's stuff that you can't predict and sometimes you have the opportunity if you could get three if you had 300k and you could know you could have that 300k by the end of the week then you know that with, you'll be able to invest that in your current products because they've started sell, selling more quickly and you'll be able to turn that 350k into 450k within your cash conversion cycle within five to six months now the problem is you don't have that 300k there 
And you could try and get it from the bank, but the bank's going to take maybe two weeks to a month to, to even be able to give you an indication of whether you're going to get it. And then it, and then it's gone because you're not going to have those products there for Black you lost momentum, yeah. You lost, yeah, you lost the momentum. You, you miss the dates. So you, you know, you miss your, your season or the, or the e-commerce season uh, per se. It just moves too slowly. So that's, I think that's our source of value creation that to be able to, for appropriate, and quite large amounts, um, large meaning that our largest credit lines, for want of a better word, or our, our largest total loan um, facilities are several hundred thousands um, to, to our biggest uh, clients. We, we can make these decisions very, very quickly. Got it, understood. Okay, fascinating, great. Lisa, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, in, in the interest of time, uh, since we are com coming up on that hour, I do want to go on ahead and do a wrap-up of the episode. So, Nathan, thank you so much for sharing your story. We're going to do a quick recap of your story. We're going to let folks know where they can learn more about Full Fin, and then we're going to hear a message from you at the very end uh, for the entrepreneurs listening. So, uh, Nathan Evans, co-founder of Full Fin, uh, came from a very small town um, outside of London, we'll call it, so Burton-on-Trent, mainly a brewing town, but dad was a carpet fitter, mom was a housewife. Not a very uh, sport. 40 child, but very, very smart. Joined the Air Cadets in your teen years with the hopes of being a pilot, but did not get in, unfortunately, because of the eyesight. And in lieu of taking a second choice job, decided to go to school for physics and was studying for the love of studying, enrolling in the Imperial College in 1993. Um, ended up living on a boat because I couldn't afford a flat, which is a very interesting story, like you said. Um, and ended up graduating um, in 1997 after spending some time in Germany studying as well, which kind of began the love of Germany and German culture. Um, after graduating, went to work for a boutique investment bank in Greenwich, worked there for a couple of years, and then made a total shift um, and fell into a role in the front of office. So kind of always living in like that fintech world before it was kind of called fintech, but went from back of house now to front of house doing interbank broking, very Wolf of Wall Street style. Um, and ended up going to a brokerage for a gentleman who wanted to, you know, that was, sorry, the Wolf of Wall Street style brokerage was from a gentleman who needed somebody who spoke German very young, who was going to be very ambitious to make those calls and build the German business. Worked there for about a year um, and ended up moving on uh, September 11th, 2001. So you're working for a business growing in Germany, but not living there quite yet. Moved in 2001 and lived there from 01 to 08, uh, working in a trading a variety of different products, continued um, working at a regional bank. And then of course the financial crisis hit. So um, banking industry became highly regulated and it was kind of an opportunity to, as you said, exit stage left, uh, moved to Switzerland, again, working in FinTech called SendGuard, I think was the name of the company that you said. Close. Close. Um, close. Um, it was, you know, totally unrelated to what you'd been doing before, um, but worked, so lived in Switzerland in total for seven years for a couple of different companies. So the big tech company uh, worked for a startup called Beekeeper, the Swiss Stock Exchange, had a social business engagement that you'd said with the schools in Cambodia, I think I understood. Um, and ultimately moved back to Germany in 2015 when your wife was expecting your first child. I'm going to work for an e-commerce platform, the largest B2B e-commerce platform now known as Unite, working in product management, um, still on the lending and financial side of things. Left Unite in 2017 to work for a fintech SME lender, which kind of really aligns with what you do now with full fin. Um, doing some horizontal SME lending for a matter of months. And that is actually where you met your co-founder at this um, this organization where you spent a couple of months that was your personal Vietnam, as you had said. Um, and then after a quick trip to California to pop in and the different meetups and the folks in the incubators and some of these startup founders that you knew, um, got a lot of inspiration and learnings and then came back to start Full Fin in officially 2018, uh, helping German sellers with their short-term working capital loans. So quick recap of everything there. Um, want to let folks know where they can learn more and reach out if they have any questions, specifically for our German-based sellers. You're going to be the best fit. And then we'd like to hear from you a message of hope or inspiration for entrepreneurs listening. So let's start with the website. Cool. Mo, if that's over to me, then the website is simplefullfin.com. We, we have the .com, which is wonderful. If, um, 
people want to reach out in terms of it needs to be quick and they want capital, that's where the application can be made as well in a matter of minutes. If they if they want to talk to somebody, they can they can hit up the team on sales at Fulfin and um, Nathan at Fulfin.com. It's not too difficult to guess anyway is how you get straight through to me. Perfect. And for our audio listeners, that is Fulfin, F-U-L-F-I-N, like if you put fulfillment and finance together, dot com, and then Nathan at Fulfin.com. And then Nathan, for um, the last bit of our episode here, we'd like to hear from you, message of hope or inspiration for entrepreneurs listening. Yeah, you asked me. You asked me at the start. It kind of put, puts you on the on the on the spot to a certain extent. But uh, one thing that I've been involved in in in, Germ, in Germany since I became entrepreneur active myself is early early stage entrepreneurs um, helping run a an incubator called the Founder Institute, which comes out of the Valley. Uh, very well known. I, I've seen a, a lot of people from different different backgrounds who shouldn't be able to make it. it. It used to be a lot more difficult. And and now, especially I think FBA entrepreneurship is, is one example um, there are. There are so many, there's so many more options. There's so much more support out there that if you really want to do it and you recognize you have that window of opportunity to, to try, um, you really need to believe in the dream. Uh, it, it, it can it, it can be it can be done and we've seen that within within fulfill within our clients as well we've seen those inspirational kids who have, have built businesses within and exited them within two years and and set themselves up for for life now there's a, you know, it's a lot of hard work behind the dream as as well but you should always you sh- you should always be prepared to to go and roll the dice always be dreaming yeah Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nathan. We appreciate that. We appreciate your time today. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you so much. And thank you for everybody who tuned in. If you guys liked what you heard today, please be sure to give us a thumbs up, share your thoughts in the comments, subscribe to the show, and we will see you on the next one. 